pleasure to welcome you here to the 26th Annual Small Business of the Year Awards. We hope that you have had an opportunity to walk the expo floor and visit Fun Enterprises, get your uh, picture on the front of Forbes magazine, and we hope you also enjoyed uh, the music from So Distinct, the jazz quartet that played a little earlier. Uh, they're featured each week at Epicure. Epicure is one of our winners of uh, the award. This That's right. Today's program is sponsored by Bank of America. We're going to ask folks just to kind of settle down. Okay, thank you. Uh, today's program is sponsored by Bank of America. Bank of America started out in 1904, serving a specific market segment, Italian Americans in San Francisco. They were being denied service at existing banks. From that humble start, they now serve 49 million customers and offer industry-leading support to 3 million small business owners through an innovative suite of award-winning online products and services. We are happy for Bank of America sponsorship today, and uh, as many of you know, they have been with us from the beginning. So, You will notice uh, an umbrella, like so. I know it's bad luck to open this. I won't open it all the way, but this is a Bank of America umbrella to be used for the rain, but today you can use it for the sun, because tomorrow it's supposed to be even sunnier. So if you happen to sit down and there was an umbrella at your seat, that's yours to take home. That's our centerpiece. <laughs> we are at full capacity, so if you have an extra seat, please raise your hand if someone is looking for one. <laughs> All right, we got a couple of umbrellas in the back there. Please now join me in a moment of silence in memory of our U.S. servicemen and women that are on active duty throughout the world protecting our way of life. Thank you so much, and thank you for their service, and any service members that are in the audience, thank you. It is, uh, at this time, I encourage you to enjoy this wonderful lunch. Again, get going with your salads. Uh, as soon as you're done, uh, they'll be bringing out your main course. In 1963, President John F. Kennedy created National Small Business Week to honor small business owners and recognize uh, their value and the, the value that small businesses bring to the American economy. Today, we are here to continue that story tradition and honor those individuals whose impact extends far beyond their reach, touching the lives of their peers, their families, their successors, and inspiring the minds of budding entrepreneurs everywhere. Today's recipients will join a long list of triumphant businesses who continue to use their ingenuity to adapt to changing economic and social climates to not only uh, survive, but to thrive. And I'd like to update you on a few businesses that have been honored here at this awards program over the last few years. Let's see if you can identify who they are. Our 1999 Entrepreneur of the Year started out operating a lunch cart on Boston Common, selling rolled pita bread sandwiches. She was from this area. She stumbled upon a wildly popular product in 1996, and by 1999, the year she received the Metro South uh, Small Business of the Year Award, she operated out of an 8,000 square foot facility in Randolph, just to the north, and had grown from two employees, her and her husband, uh, to seven employees. By 2006, the company was selling nearly $65 million per year and employed more than 300 people. They were so successful that they began receiving corporate offers to purchase their business in its entirety. Pepsi Cola won the bid and now operates the company out of the original factory in Randolph. A true entrepreneur, the owner has since opened a juice bar in Needham. Who is she? Anybody know? Stacy Madison, that's right, from Stacy's Pita Chips. 
Our 1998 Small Business of the Year started as a franchise in Brockton in 1988. The current owner purchased the company in 1992, turning it into an independent business with two employees. In 1998, the year they received the Metro South Small Business of the Year Award, they had grown to 14 employees. They now employ over 65 people and have grown from a half a million in sales to over 10 million in sales. The company also now does work for some of the very large clients, including Gillette Stadium, Fenway Park, and Stewart Healthcare. Who is that company? Sign Design, that's right. And we have one of the owners here with us, Scott Farino. A round of applause for Sign Design. And finally, one more. Uh, our 2008 entrepreneur was established by two parents in a warehouse in Rockland in 2005. In the past five years, their sales have gone up 500%. Their product is now seen in the hands of many celebrities and is sold in major stores across America. In fact, this week, one was stolen from Disney, a Disney ride, if anybody saw that on your feed. Uh, and it was recovered, uh, but it was an $1,800 uh, item, including Bye Bye Baby in Bloomingdale's. They are also now found in 40 countries with plans to expand into eight more by the end of the year. They also have their brand on the Dasher, Dasher board at Bruins Games and have partnered with the Boston Bruins on fundraising events. They continue to demonstrate their ingenuity with the induction, introduction this year of a product that incorporates a first-to-market fire retardant seat. Who is it? Up a baby, that's right, someone got it over here. Bob and Lauren Monahan uh, were the recipients in 2008. Later, we will recognize two more businesses as they join this esteemed list. We hope that any budding entrepreneurs or small businesses in the audience are inspired to, leap, uh, to take a leap of faith and to live your dream. With a uh, recovering economy, open markets, tremendous recent investment in the region, and accessible, uh, accessible financing, now is truly the time to open a new business. It is now my pleasure to welcome our MC this afternoon. Please join me in welcoming Chamber Chairman of the Board, Jerry Nadeau of Rockland Trust. Jerry. Good morning. It is my honor to participate in this very special award program as we celebrate the success of so many businesses and their contributions to the local economy. There are currently over 28.2 million small businesses in the United States. Small businesses serve as the backbone of our country, according, accounting for 60 to 80 percent of all new jobs each year. Small businesses allow communities to derive higher tax revenues, which in turn are used to improve our cities and towns. Small businesses also work at the micro level of the economy, employing local workers, borrowing at convenient banks, and sourcing products locally. The Metro South Chamber supports small businesses, entrepreneurship through top-notch resources, advocacy, con consultation, and programming. Our Chamber's ambassadors are a key component of the Chamber's programming. Let's take a moment to acknowledge our ambassadors in attendance today. And they are, and I'm going to read where their firm is as well, Rico McNeil, Bridgewater Savings. <clears throat> Bob Sansone in Serpity. I'm saying that right. There you go, Brian, down the back. Brian Hoffman, the Children's Museum in Easton. <laughs> Murray Vetstein, Source 4, over in the corner. <laughs> Catherine Light, Mansfield Bank. <laughs> Richard Hook, Crescent Credit Union. <laughs> and Brenda Karens, OCES. We also have with us some elected officials who recognize the importance of small business within the community. First, our Mayor Bill Carpenter. <laughs> State Representative Claire Cronin. <laughs> and State Representative Jerry Cassidy. <laughs> and later, we look forward to hearing from Lieutenant Governor Karen Polito. Now, I'd like to introduce Bob Nelson from the SBA. Bob was appointed district director of SBA's Massachusetts district office in November of 2007 
As District Director, Mr. Nelson is responsible for the effective delivery of SBA's financial and business development programs with a mission to counsel, assist, and protect the interests of small businesses statewide in order to provide, maintain, and strengthen the economy. He has 24 years of federal service, 17 of which have been with the SBA. During his tenure as District Director, Massachusetts has seen tremendous increases in the use of SBA loan programs statewide. Please welcome Bob Nelson. Thank you, Jerry, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. As Jerry mentioned, my name is Bob Nelson. I'm the director of the Small Business Administration for the state of Massachusetts, and it's an honor and pleasure to be here with all of you during Small Business Month and to celebrate and recognize the importance of small businesses here in the Commonwealth. Uh, I did want to uh, start off by thanking Chris Cooney and the Metro South Chamber for its partnership and uh, support of SBA and our small businesses and appreciate the, uh, the time to be able to talk about the SBA and uh, to share just a, a quick message from us. But uh, when you think of the, the chamber and the SBA, our missions are very much tied uh, together in a couple key core areas and that is to help uh, businesses to build relationships and networks, to also educate businesses and to introduce them to resources but also to celebrate the significant accomplishments of our small businesses and what they do to grow jobs and to build uh, vibrant communities. This is what today's event is all about with the expo, with the award ceremony today, and then with the listening uh, session, which is taking place with the Lieutenant Governor. But uh, for those of you who know me, uh, you know that I am an eternal optimist and I love to talk about the positive. And I even joke with people that I'm so positive, even my blood type is B positive. And uh, my, that's, a, that's a fact, but, uh, but seriously, uh, you know, what I want to talk about is the economy. Uh, so uh, here in uh, the Commonwealth, uh, you know, we're looking at unemployment less than 4%. Uh, we have strong uh, consumer and business confidence. Uh, we have a widening gap between uh, business starts and business closures, which is another positive indicator for small businesses in the economy. And it's actually at the widest uh, range that it's been in many, many years. Uh, and we also have near historic interest rates, uh, but uh, lots of construction taking place, not only in Boston, Worcester, Springfield, but a lot of communities in between. Uh, but it all points to very good news for small businesses. But we absolutely know that there are gaps and challenges. This is where the SBA comes in to try to help with equal access and opportunity through our loan programs, through our technical assistance, but also our government contracting assistance. I, I did want to start off and, and just talk uh, briefly about the SBA's administrator, uh, Linda McMahon. And so uh, for those of you who don't know the name McMahon, so uh, Linda McMahon is Vince McMahon's wife. Uh, she was appointed by President Trump to uh, serve on the cabinet and to be the administrator of the SBA. She's the SBA's 25th administrator. Uh, she was the former CEO and also the co-founder of World Wrestling Entertainment. Uh, and for those of you who uh, are fans, uh, what you know is that WWE started off as a very small regional uh, enterprise and who has now grown to this global, global uh, organization with over 800 employees. It really is an amazing story, especially when you hear her tell it. And so um, the uh, entire SBA, we were lucky to have her on an all town employee town hall to hear her vision and for her to share her story. And so uh, what she shared with all of us was that early on, uh, her and her, her husband uh, in their business, they ran into some financial difficulties. Uh, they even experienced a foreclosure on a personal residence, had a car repossessed right out of their driveway. Uh, she was talking about 
the decision to lease a typewriter at $12 a month because they couldn't afford a typewriter. Uh, and what, she was telling us this story because she, what she wanted us to know is while she's hugely successful uh, now, she gets it and she knows that it's hard work to run a small business. She knows the challenges that small businesses face. Uh, especially in those early years uh, when they're starting and looking to grow. And it's one of the reasons why, you know, she's telling us how excited she is to be leading the SBA and, uh, you know, helping small businesses uh, to start and grow uh, through our programs. And, and when you think of the SBA, uh, you know, uh, the capital uh, through SBA loans, very critical. Uh, but if you don't have the knowledge and skills, the technical assistance, you know, most likely uh, you could be looking at a failure. And so you have to couple those things together, very important, and so the SBA, we do a lot of work uh, through our resource partners, the Small Business Development Center Network, the SCORE organization, the Center for Women and Enterprise, and also our Veterans Business Outreach Center. And I can tell you that here in Southeastern Mass, you absolutely have some of the best, most passionate people uh, available free of charge to help you uh, with that mentorship and that business advice. Uh, so please take advantage of the resources and let your friends and associates know about the resources that are available. So uh, the, the other thing I wanted to share with you, so over the last uh, month, I did get two personal calls on my cell phone from the administrator. Uh, you know, it's, certainly the first one, it caught me off guard and I was in the car and picked up my phone like I always do and said, Bob Nelson, SBA. And uh, the voice on the other line said, uh, hi, Bob, this is Linda McMahon. And so I, I didn't expect it. And so I just, hi, Linda, how you doing? And you know, normally I should be saying Administrator McMahon, uh, you know, Madam Administrator. And so, but, you know, but it was just a call for her to, uh, you know, touch uh, the field leadership and she wanted us to know how important she sees the role of the field and what we do. Uh, we are the, the voice and the ears and the eyes of small business and she, you know, you look at the sales force that she developed through uh, World Wrestling Enter Entertainment and, you know, uh, I am confident that she's going to help with the rebranding of the SBA taking us uh, to new levels, next steps. But the other message that she absolutely uh, shared is that she wants us to concentrate on our bread and butter in our mission, which is helping small businesses to access capital uh, through SBA loans and uh, uh, the technical assistance, but also the government contracting assistance. You know, I, I wanted to spend just a uh, little bit of time talking about SBA loans just because that's probably what we're most well known for. And so uh, with SBA, uh, there's no downward size limit. We go all the way up to $5 million. You need to know that we don't make the loan, the bank makes the loan. What we do is we provide a guarantee to help them get comfortable enough to say yes and to make the deal happen. And I can tell you, you know, SBA loans, they can be used for all different types of purposes, whether it's to buy a franchise, business expansion, inventory, uh, lots of different reasons. And, uh, you know, I'm very happy uh, to report that uh, it's something that I track uh, pretty regularly is our ranking here in Massachusetts and how we're comparing to the other 68 district offices around the country. And I can tell you that uh, the Massachusetts SBA, we're number one in the entire country on low dollar loan approvals. Uh, we're uh, also, uh, you know, number uh, one on low dollar loans and underserved when you put those two together and under $150,000. Uh, a lot of work trying to make sure that we help our veterans, uh, our minority entrepreneurs, our women entrepreneurs. But uh, we've been trailing Los Angeles and on May 5th, you know, we beat out Los Angeles and became the number one office in the country on overall SBA 7A approval. So, uh, you know, it, for the lenders who are here, uh, you know, you deserve deserve all the applause and recognition because it's your money, it's your work, you're the ones who are helping to get that uh, the funds out on the street. Uh, so uh, if everyone could uh, join me in applauding all the lenders uh, who are here. So, um, you know, 
uh, this month is Small Business Month. It's also Military uh, Appreciation Month, and so I echo uh, the words of, of Chris Cooney with uh, thanking uh, veterans and uh, the military community for what you do uh, and for your service. Uh, but um, you know. Last week was National Small Business Week, uh, actually on May 2nd, where at SBA we had our awards and we recognized 12 uh, amazing businesses. And, and all of those businesses talked about the uh, importance of employees in their organization. And th that is the critical component. But they all, all talked about growing revenues. Uh, but th the, the key thing that I want to share with you and the one thing that stands out is how all small businesses, how they support their communities through uh, charitable uh, work in support of nonprofits and building communities. And I'm sure the businesses who are being recognized today, you know, fit into that same category. So on behalf of the SBA, I, I want to uh, applaud the businesses who are being recognized today, but certainly uh, a pleasure to be here with all of you. And uh, thank you for the good work. Uh, keep it up and go Celtics. Thank you. The, um, you know, I think I wanted to personally thank Bob, as you can see by his passion, as a longtime business partner in my day-to-day -day job at Rockland Trust and being involved with the Chamber and SEED and other organizations, we can't have a better business partner than Bob Nelson, the SBA. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> Next, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Paw Sox Vice Chairman Mike Tamburo. And I also want to, I guess I'm a little bit out of order here, so I'm going to apologize. So I'd like to alert everyone, there are green forms on your tables for the question and answer session following our keynote address. Please write down any questions you may have for Mr. Tamburo and the chamber staff member will be by to pick them up. This is your chance. Mike Tamburo was named president of the Pawtucket Red Sox in January of 1985 after serving as general manager of the Paw Sox from 1977 to 1984. During his 35 years with the club, Mike Timboro has led a remarkable transformation that has seen the Pawtucket Red Sox rise from a once bankrupt organization to one of the strongest and most successful franchises in minor league baseball. Under Timboro's leadership, the Paw Sox have gone from drawing 70,000 fans in 1977 to over 575,000 fans in each of the past eight seasons. In addition to serving on the Minor League Baseball Board of Trustees, Mike is a founding board member of Burco, Baseball Internet Rights Corporation, and a director of the International League. He also helped create the Pawtucket Red Sox Charitable Foundation that supports numerous charitable groups throughout New England. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Mr. Mike Timboro. <laughs> Thank you very much. What a great honor to be here. What a nice crowd. Beautiful to see so many people out here. And what a wonderful day. We had David Price pitching at McCoy Stadium Sunday, and it rained like hell. And here we are today with the club on the road, and it's gorgeous. <laughs> but again, it's great to be here. Small business. Uh, we want to chat a little bit about it. When we started, Ben Mondor and I, 40 years ago, McCoy Stadium and the Paw Sox were exactly that, a very small business. It was Ben and I for a very long time, and the PR department has put together a, a little notebook here. Right, Joe? Yeah. And we're gonna, we're gonna kind of, by pictures, tell the story of what happened with the Paw Sox. And this first one, this is the stadium that we came into in 1977. No bats. We took over a bankrupt fran franchise. No bats, no balls, no paper, no pencil. We had a couch in the corner with a spring popping out of it. And there was this copy machine that when you push the button, the copy would come out on fire at the end. <laughs> And being a 25-year-old kid, I kind of liked the idea of watching this. And I would spend hours just pushing that button and watching that thing come out on fire. I was amazed. But that's where we started. We started 
in negative numbers. We had over a million dollars in 1977 debts, which today would translate to about $12 million in debts. And go ahead, Joe, you can move it. And then 35 years later, McCoy Stadium was turned into this great little park. Uh, great memories, and to watch this facility grow. Well, first of all, I think I need to tell you that the $12 million debt, we approached every single vendor that the previous ownership owed money to, made arrangements, worked out, worked out the issue with every single vendor, and made good on what they were owed. It took us a while. We did it the old-fashioned way, but it allowed us a stable foundation on which we built this club. So this is what it, this is what it is today. This is what it became after the great renovation in 1998. Well, that young guy is my son. <laughs> That's Ben Mondor and I. And that may have been our first day together on the job. Uh, I remember walking into a dirty, damp, old McCoy Stadium. We walked up the main ramp, which was in the middle of the building, and we made our way toward the first base stand, and there was litter every place. Now, we had just gotten the club. It was January of 1977. Uh, the place hadn't been cleaned since closing day that previous uh, fall. And we went down to the first base side where there had been an old fried chicken stand. And frozen in, the, in a puddle were chicken bones. And Ben hit one of those chicken bones and went flying head over heels and landed flat on his back. And he looked up at me and he said, son, Every businessman makes one mistake. This better not be mine. <laughs> and we were fortunate because this happened. What we were selling, the way we were treating people, though we used to call it one-on-one -on -one combat. Wherever one person met somebody else, we would be there to speak. We shook hands, I, you know, we talked, uh, we talked about after games. We felt like parish priests, welcoming the congregation as they came and as they went. But we did it one customer at a time, the old-fashioned way, again. This was the magical moment for the franchise, the longest game in the history of baseball occurred at McCoy Stadium April 18th, April 19th, and June 23rd, 1981. Why three days? We started, the, the night started when the light tower in right center field went out. So the 7.30 start didn't begin till about eight o'clock but it was foreshadowing of what was about to happen. It was a cold April night. The wind was blowing straight in from right field. It was uncommonly cold for April and an uncommon wind. I mean, balls that you thought were hit out would just fly back to the infield. It was like nothing I've ever seen. I hope I never see it again. Once you're up all night at a baseball game, you never want to do it again. But this game put us on the map. Uh, Wade Boggs and Cal Ripken were the opposing shortstops, two Hall of Famers, uh, two great guys who have come back for the, and not annual, but, the, but the, uh, the big events when we've had the 25th anniversary of the longest game and the 35th anniversary. Uh, but it was, a, again, a long, cold night. Uh, many remarkable stories from that night. Uh, one of my favorites is Joe Morgan getting thrown out in the 22nd inning. 
and he had no place to go, so he was sitting in the office about two o'clock in the morning and the phone rings, and it's his wife, and he answers the phone, and she said, Joe, what are you doing? He said, Daddy, we're still playing. She said, Joe, are you guys drinking again? <laughs> if you're playing, what the hell are you doing answering the phone? <laughs> We also had a player named Luisa Ponti, who the game ended at 4.09 a.m. And we'll talk a little bit about the ending of the game. The game ended at 4.09. He went home about 5 o'clock and was knocking at the door, and his wife wouldn't let him in. She said, you've been out all night. You're not coming in now. He had to sleep on the trainer's bench. True story. But the game, the game ended uh, on, the mor on Easter Sunday morning at 4.09 a.m. Uh, and was scheduled to be replayed the following day, but all uh, cooler minds prevailed, and we decided to continue the game June 23rd. And what just happened to be in the middle of the first major big league strike, so baseball was shut down, and when the longest game continued, it was the biggest sport of it, sporting event, not only in the country, but perhaps in the world on that day. We had every major daily represented. We had the Manichi Daily News from Tokyo there. We had the BBC there. It was a remarkable media event. I mean, this is the, 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 the managers bringing out the, uh, the batting lineups, and we had media on the field taking photos of that. But the longest game ended in the shortest possible time. At 6.23 a.m., uh, p.m., I'm sorry, not a.m., 6.23 p.m., Dave Koza got the base hit to win the game when everybody on the East Coast went to the live shot. They went to their live shot and they caught Dave Koza on their sports show and caught Dave Koza getting the base hit that won the longest game. And there it is right there. And Marty Barrett scored the winning run. Wade, 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 Boggs, Wade Boggs was waiting for his opportunity to play at the major league level. He hit 300 three years in a row and never got a call up. And he was all upset that he never got a chance to win the longest game because he thought that would be his opportunity to get noticed by the major league club. Dave Kozer instead got the little number that won the game and that became the springboard for the success of this club. I mean, suddenly everybody in Rhode Island and Southeastern Mass realized that something special could happen, on, happen at this little band box on Columbus Ave in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. And I think uh, 16 of the next 23 years, we set attendance records. So it was a remarkable event that really the franchise was built on. The bird. The bird was the next major craze that hit the stadium, and that happened a year later. Uh, Fidrich was trying to make a comeback. Uh, he was a special guy, a real character of the game. Uh, patting the mound, kissing the baseball, talking the baseballs. You had to see this to believe it. Uh, he was in Pawtucket the night that Dave Rigetti got sent down by Columbus. And it became the biggest minor league matchup, pitching-wise, in the history of the minor leagues. McCoy Stadium sat 6,000 people in those days, and that night we had 9,000 people in that building. 
and we learned a very valuable lesson. Never put 9,000 people in a building that seats 6,000. <laughs> There's the great photo. It was a great matchup. Bird got the win. Rigetti struck out six of the first nine batters he faced. We thought he was going to pitch the ultimate game. He struck out the first five. Uh, but Fidrich was there at the end. And 9,000 people, after the bird got the last out of the game, he struck out Butch Hobson to win the game. 9,000 people stood and waited for Bird to come back on the field and take a bow. And it was one of the most heartwarming nights uh, that, I, that, I, that I ever thought I'd see at that, at that park. Special night. And then the parade of players who made their way through our operation. This is Clemens, but 68% of the players who play with, the, with, the, with our club have gone on to play in the major leagues, and that's the highest percentage of any AAA club in the country. And that's because we try and do it the right way. We try and make these kids feel part of our family. We want them to have everything that they need to make the most of their careers. We want to give them whatever they, they need batting tunnel wise, weight room wise, so that they can become the best player they can possibly be. Pedroia, this guy, <clears throat> a remarkable battler, remarkable competitor, uh, Ron Johnson was our manager and Pedroia got called up. And Pedroia sat beside Johnson in the dugout his very first game. And the Toledo third baseman made an outstanding play. And Johnson looked over to Petey and said, you'll never see that play again in a million years. Three innings later, same hitter, Hits the ball the same place, the third baseman makes the same play, throws the guy out. Pedroia looks at Johnson and says, time flies in AAA. <laughs> John Lester, the one we let get away. Great pitcher, great kid. I wish we signed him, I wish we signed him. Chuck, Sh Kurt Schilling. Chuck Schilling was the shortstop when I was a kid. Kurt Schilling, we can put this on in Massachusetts. In Rhode Island, we wouldn't do it. <laughs> and Big Poppy, just a special guy, a special personality. Uh, used to tell the ushers to bring down the kids to the clubhouse after the game, and he'd spend a half an hour just signing autographs for the kids. He was a special guy. He still is a special guy. That's, uh, you know, a lot of these players become scouts or become instructors. Dwight Evans is one of my favorite guys, and you think we're arguing about a player, we're really arguing about wines. He likes Pinot Noirs, I like Cavs. We fight like hell about it. Dwight's a great guy. Last year, we, we created the Paw Sox Hall of Fame. And the first class of inductees were Jim Rice, Wade Boggs, and Ben Mondor. Uh, this is Jim Rice on that night giving Madeline Mondor, Ben's wife, a big hug. Uh, it was a special moment. Uh, ben really worked hard to get Jim uh, into the Hall of Fame, and Jim never, uh, never took for granted Ben's letter writing, and Ben had the ability to drive people a little crazy every once in a while. There's Jim with his acceptance speech, and Boggs will follow. And you know, again, business, Customers, you need to treat them well, one at a time. You build customers one at a time. I'm not telling any of you anything that you don't know. And the same holds true in our business. It's one fan at a time. 
Again, it's like being the parish priest, shaking hands, getting to know the folks, welcoming them as they come in, saying goodnight to them every night when they leave, making them feel that McCoy is a special place and they make it even more special. Uh, the season ticket holders I like to play around with and I've been doing it for more years than I want to tell you, but I still love it and I think that's what it's all about. These are some of the promos that we do on the field. Uh, this was the five million fan. Uh, they won a Volkswagen for being the five million fan. And I don't know who, who's driving. I hope it wasn't Pause of Sox. <laughs> Anything that brings a smile to a kid's face is what our business is all about. Uh, giveaway items are a big part of it. Uh, that's worth a million bucks to me. Always great to see crowds at the stadium. It makes, makes it all worthwhile and makes you feel like what you're doing is right. Kids having fun. This is very special and unique to McCoy Stadium. Autographs. Uh, it's a second story stadium. Uh, people ask me why. I really found out that this was supposed to be a dog track back in 1942 when the mayor built the stadium. But the second story stadium creates unique ways for the autograph seekers to try and get their favorite player's autograph. And what was nice is the Hall of Fame has a photo of the year. And I believe in 2007, it wasn't this photo, but it was a photo like this, uh, was baseball's photo of the year. It was kids getting autographs at our, at our park. Bronson Arroyo pitched the first perfect game in the International League in 97 years, in about 2001. This, is, uh, this was another major event at the stadium uh, that none of us will forget who were there. A tip of the hat from Bronson. And he came over, we gave him a bottle of champagne, and then we dug out the rubber and presented the rubber to him after the game. Kids are what the business is all about. Families, kids, taking care of the kids, taking care of the families. Quality family entertainment in a safe and clean environment at the lowest possible price has been the philosophy for over 40 years and continues to be the philosophy today. Nothing like a, 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 stands, a, a, a full stands. That, that, that's, that's what you dream of in this business. Clinics. Clinics are another way that we built our brand. We had five, we have six or seven. Joe, I don't know how many you have today, but as we do as many clinics as we can. We want the kids involved with the players, involved with the game, learning the game. And no better way, there's no better way to, to extend the brand than to have your players involved with the kids of the community and autographs, making players available for autographs so the kids leave with an autograph and a smile. That's what it's all about, folks. This is our Challenger Clinic, and this is a very special one. Uh, Little League Baseball instituted a, a Challenger program maybe about 10 years ago, and we invite all the Challenger teams in Massachusetts and in our state, Rhode Island, uh, to a clinic on the last, one of the last Saturdays of the year. And to see the players work with some of these kids who are in wheelchairs or have other issues, it's about as heartwarming as anything that we do. Uh, Joe, I think you can attest to that. 
This guy is a very special guy. He was our manager uh, one half season when he was about 85 years old. Uh, Lou Gorman replaced our current manager of the day and Johnny came in to fill out the season and uh, he had a blast. He really had a great time managing the club and wanted to come back and got real mad when uh, Lou Gorman didn't invite him back the following year. Fireworks. McCoy is synonymous with him. We try and have the biggest and best shows, always to music. It's a great night out if you've never been if you've never been to a camp day, we probably have about 500 groups all in the same color shirt. The ballpark looks like a rainbow. It's amazing to see. And then hospital visits, getting the mascots and the players to visit hospitals, getting involved in the community. That that's what extends the brand, and that's what it's all about. Running the bases is an institution on Sundays. We let the kids on the field to run. Uh, it's probably the only game of the week where the, most of the crowd stays till the very end but it's great to see the kids on the field running. And this is our sleepovers. We started sleepovers about 40 years ago with the scouts. And I'll tell you, as impressive as this looks, to look from the grandstands down on the field to see these tents across the outfield is, it's amazing. It's so colorful. Uh, it's something else. It's really something to see. Special Olympics, we've been promoters of this great organization for many, many years, and we're happy to support the great work that they do. And just some memories. And this is what we announced yesterday. Plans for a new ballpark on the Apex site the new stadium at Slater Mill, it has the chance to be something very special, not only for the ball club, but especially for a city, an old mill city that has not moved forward for maybe 40 years. The mayor is very supportive. He loves this idea. The development potential around this stadium that we want to spearhead is a big part of the plan. It'll be an $83 million project, 73 for the stadium itself. The ball club is prepared to spend 61%, which is the most generous offer by a private organization to a public ballpark in the history of the minor leagues. Uh, early indications have been positive. Um, we hope to open this by 2020. We'd love to tell you more about it if you're interested. But we're not going to do it from here. Some more views here, Mike. Different views. It's right on the river. The dimensions will be exactly the same as Fenway Park on the inside. The exterior will have a Rhode Island feel to it. Uh, it'll be a park within a park, and what I mean by that is the park will be open when the club is on the road, so fans can run the warning track, have lunch on the green monster, lay on the plush green grass, until we put the sprinklers on. <laughs> uh, I want to leave you with a couple of thoughts. What I call My memories are my lessons from the ballpark. We have two or three lessons. The first one is the Parsocks golden rule. 
And that golden rule is, rule number one is the customer is always right. And rule number two is if the customer is wrong, see rule one. Lesson number two is that companies should always give before they take. Support the community in its endeavors, be a great member of your community, and be involved with special organizations like the Chamber of Commerce. And lesson number three, it's the obligation of every successful business to give back. There needs to be a willingness on behalf of all of us, us small business people who become successful, to take care of those less fortunate. We'll take some questions, but I just want to say thank you very much for having me. I've really enjoyed our time together. Thanks for letting me bring my photo album, and I appreciate the time. What do you think of some of the economic benefits brought to communities as a result of hosting a minor league baseball team. I think the biggest thing that's happening in the industry today is development, the ancillary development that is occurring around these ballparks are remarkable. Durham, North Carolina, uh, it's just remarkable what has been built up around, behind, and near the stadium. I went to, the, to this ballpark when they first built it in 1993, and it was the old tobacco warehouses. They were empty, they were rotting away, there was graffiti all over them. And to go there today and see what they've done with those old, with those old buildings is remarkable. It's mixed use, it's commercial, it's residential, it's restaurants, it's party areas, it's remarkable. So that's what we're trying to build in our new site. Ancillary de development is the absolute key. Today, the Chamber and Bank of America are pleased to recognize business achievement with the presentation of the 2017 Entrepreneur and Small Business of the Year Awards. We want to thank all of the, those of you who submitted nominations for these awards. We had a number of very strong candidates making this year's decision even more difficult. The nominating committee looks for companies that balance success with a commitment to the community. Each nominee is rated based on five criteria, number of employees, staying power, growth, social responsibility, and innovation. To meet just a few of these criteria is a significant accomplishment. Before we present these awards, I would like to once again take a moment to recognize today's luncheon sponsor, Bank of America. Let's give them a round of applause. The, the Entrepreneur of the Year Award recognizes innovative individuals whose businesses have grown through their commitment to their customers and their community. The Metro South Chamber and Bank of America Small Business Services are pleased to present the 2017 Entrepreneur of the Year Award to Epicure Wine and Jazz Bar. <laughs> Michael and Tony Rigo always enjoyed listening to live jazz. There we go, from Michael and Tony. Their problem? There was very few places to go south of Boston. In 2016, they set out on their dream to open a jazz bar in the Metro South area and opened Epicure Wine Bar Jazz Club in a strip mall located at 320 West Center Street in West Bridgewater. Epicure offers a wide selection of specialty wines and craft beers, creative culinary offering, and live jazz music every Wednesday through Saturday. They bring a high caliber of nationally known jazz groups who perform at Scholars Jazz Club in Cambridge one night and at Epicure in West Bridgewater the next. What started out as a four-day operation with one full-time person, cheese platters, and 24 types of wine has grown to a five-day operation with four employees, a full menu, and over 60 types of wine. In addition, they now offer specialty events such as brewery and winery pairing, monthly four-course beer dinners, and other such events. Epicure has also extended into the community. They are an active participant in the Be Happy Music Program, geared towards adults with special needs and abilities. They also host a jazz jam every Wednesday for local musicians. 
Epicure is currently working on developing a program to feature students from the local high school jazz programs, including Brockton High School. Would Michael Rigo please join us on the stage to be recognized as the Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to um, extend to you guys a thanks and um, a nice welcome from my wife. She was not able to be here today. In addition to being um, the executive chef, she's also a hairdresser in West Bridgewater. Um, and so she wanted to make sure that I said uh, hello and thank you. I call her Wonder Woman at home because I don't know how she does it. She's got a very busy schedule, everything that she does at Epicure. Uh, at work, we just call her the boss whenever she comes in. Um, <laughs> But uh, we are very humbled and pleased. My family and friends have heard me talk about doing something like this for a lot of years. And so to actually be able to come into it is uh, definitely a dream come true. And as all entrepreneurs know, uh, just to be recognized for everything that you put into it is uh, tremendous. Not enough words I can say, so I just say thank you very, very much. And come see us at Epicure, please. Thank you. The Small Business of the Year Award recognizes business leadership which has fostered company growth and created new jobs while contributing to the community. The 2017 Small Business of the Year Award is presented to Wood Palace Kitchens. A round of applause. In 1976, Tom Hollick, a skilled craftsman, began constructing countertops and cabinets for friends and family inside his garage. Soon after, Wood Palace Kitchens was formed. In three short years, the influx of business allowed Tim to expand Wood Palace Kitchens into the Metro South community, now located at 7 Mill Street in Middleborough. Wood Palace Kitchens is one of the region's most trusted providers and installers of quality cabinets, cabinetry, and countertops. They have doubled their employee count in the past three years to 10 employees and have grown from 100 to 150 retail clients per year and have had their revenues double from 2 million to 4 million. They work with multiple builders completing projects in Stoughton, Easton, West Bridgewater, and Canton, and they service many retail clients in the Metro South region. Wood Palace Kitchens demonstrates a high level of creativity and imagination in their marketing. Tim's book, Dream First, provides a nine minute crash course for customers and prospects to build their dream kitchen. Tim also hosts a weekly talk show, Foodaholic, on WVBF 1530 AM, featuring local restaurant owners and chefs. In addition, the company regularly hosts cooking classes with demonstrations by local chefs and high school culinary programs, as well as international nights for the public to explore the showroom while enduring multicultural cuisine. In the community, Wood Palace Kitchens has assisted in a variety of philanthropic ways. They have partnered with Special Olympics, Dana-Farber Jimmy Fund, American Cancer Society, and the Salvation Army, to name a few. They also donate a percentage of every cabinet they sell to the Make-A-Wish Foundation. On behalf of Wood Palace Kitchens, would Tom Pollock please join us on the stage to be recognized as the 2017 Metro South Small Business of the Year. Tim Oh, Tim. Oh, is it? Oh, is it? Oh, is it? Oh, is it? Oh, is I want to thank everybody. It's quite the honor. Humble for sure. Mike, what a, I wish I had his voice. He was unbelievable up there. <laughs> he should be announcing at the Fox Sox. The best Fox Sox. But um, like I said, it was 38 years ago I started the business. And like Mike says, you know, you have a dream, you have a thought, 
and you, you don't know if you're going to make it, but you believe you're going to make it, and you just got to keep going. There's the setbacks. There's all kinds of things that hit you, but if you keep going, move forward, you eventually get to where you're going to go. So I want to thank everybody. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate the honor.